Hi there, and welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. This is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from all around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to Lubomir Arsov, who is a Bulgarian artist based in Toronto, who's produced one of the most impactful, profound pieces of art I have ever seen. Now, I know that's a huge statement, but this guy just spoke to me. He created something that just cut through everything and just pierced right through that shell and just got to me. And once I saw this work of art, it really had me looking at the world in a completely different way. So what is it? Well, it was this 13 minute film that I found online called In Shadow. Now, if you've been following me online for a little while, you've been listening to some of these long form conversations, then you'll know that I'm one of those people that really questions reality around me. Now, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, but I've always had one of those minds that tried to look beyond the veil and see a little bit more about what was going on here and what is this thing that we call life and how is society set up the way it's set up? Why do things happen the way they happen? And what's really going on? Now, naturally, that questioning leads me down rabbit holes that some might consider conspiracy theories. But for me, I think it's important to question. I think it's important to really dig deep and search for what is actually the truth of the nature of reality. And that's what this film In Shadow did for me. Now, I'm going to play a little bit of it here for you in the intro here to this podcast. And I'm going to come back before I introduce Lubomir to you. But I think you'll see from this little clip that Lubomir is somebody with an awful lot to say. And in my opinion, I think he's got his finger right on the pulse.
Now that was only a very brief piece of the full 13 minute film. Now everybody's got 13 minutes, right? I'm sure you would have time to dive into that video and watch that. And I encourage you to do that before listening to this podcast. Now, when you're looking at it, depending on where you're at in your life and maybe at your stage of going through your own questioning process, you're gonna to start to see different things within that film. For myself, I was seeing so many different symbols and so many different pieces of imagery that just lined up and made sense to me. For me, this was a way of taking everything that's going on, putting it together in one cohesive work of art and then just presenting it on a silver platter and saying, this is the nature of reality. This is the world in which you live. And that really stuck with me. I've been forwarding this film to so many different you know, people, my friends and family, and people that I think might benefit from seeing this information. And I think we also live in a really interesting time right now where questions are being asked and it's important to explore these topics more than ever. So naturally, after seeing this and feeling so thoroughly inspired and I must admit, thoroughly challenged, I wanted to reach out to Lubomir and have him on the podcast and ask him all about the film, but also ask him, about his own artistic journey and what led him up to this point where he made this thing in the first place. This was a fantastic conversation. And as I always say, I get so much out of these and I really hope you do too. I wanted to ask Lubomir all about his beginnings, how he started his creative journey and what led him up to this point. So a lot was revealed in this uh, nearly two hour conversation. So I hope you get something out of this. And before you get into the podcast here, do me a quick favor. If you get anything out of any of these podcasts and click the like button for me and share this with a friend. I really need your help to spread the word about the creative endeavor. So share this on your social media, share it with Facebook, share it on Instagram, use the hashtag, the creative endeavor. And I really appreciate you doing so because it helps me get this out there. Now these conversations and podcasts are absolutely free. This is something that I love to do but I couldn't do it without you. So I appreciate you taking the time and sharing this with all of your friends and family. So without further ado, let's introduce Lubomir Arsov. Here he is in this episode of The Creative Endeavor. Lubomir, welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. I'm coming to you from New Zealand. You're all the way in Toronto. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Andrew, for having me here. I look forward to digging deep into um, all sorts of topics related to art, related to um, in shadow. And it's uh, it's it was a stormy day today in Toronto. Um, the thunder and the lightning from here was pretty awesome. Wow. And uh, yeah. We're, we, so uh, hopefully people forgive us if we have a few connection issues. I'm sure, as people can imagine, we're on opposite sides of the planet here. And um, it, it's, it's amazing that we have a connection at all and just have a, a, a chance to talk. Now, people would have seen from the intro and hopefully people took a chance to just watch that film before we get started in this conversation. So again, I just want to let anybody listening know, if you haven't seen In Shadow yet, watch that film before we, we really dive into this conversation because it will give you context for this. Um, I have to say that that film, uh, Lubomir, was, was the, one of the most, if not the most, impactful pieces of art I have ever seen. I'm not just saying that. It, you, you had an ability, you, you had this way in, in presenting that. So many things are crammed into that short piece of film that touch on so many different topics about what's going on in today's wor world. And it is confronting, it is dark, it is it has just got so many different layers to it, but it was just bang on. And like they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Man, that is an encyclopedia right there in 13 minutes. It is, it is just simply an incredible piece of art. Um, I wanna ask you all about it, and I do wanna dive deep into that film, but let me just ask uh, to, to, to just kick things off here. How did you start making art? Like what, tell us about your story and your beginnings. Cause obviously, you know, you're an amazing artist. You've got an amazing style and an amazing communication method. Like, so what, what really kicked off your art journey for you? Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, first of all, thank you for the huge compliment. I, I really appreciate that and I respect your work and your thoughts. So that's thank you for that. Um, and my journey into art started with a, a lot of doodling. I've always had a predisposition toward the visual medium. And um, I guess understanding those things around me, mostly humans, animals, objects, through drawing them, through interpreting them. And my sense for uh, just a general visual aesthetic was, was always present. I used to copy a lot of art that inspired me. I loved children's storybooks. Uh, growing up in Bulgaria, pre you know cable TV, we had two channels on television. I, um, any of the painted images of fairy tales, um, et cetera, would really, they have affected me deep in, in my soul and, and, and engaged me in a way that, that fostered understanding or thrills or fear, et cetera. And um, from there, I, uh, you know, drawing, getting into comic books, getting into animation, a lot of that uh, really thought out, crafted aesthetic and storytelling, um, it all started circulating around my deep desire and this this emerging sense in me that I really felt story uh, storytelling and I had this impulse to toward emotions visceral deep um, light whatever it is emotions uh, to be triggered to be invited out through imagery and through sequential imagery uh, by tailoring them in such a way that we gain access to a, a sequence of events that is meaningly emerging into our our sense of um, of these characters of the situation, and something about that and its infinite iterations, right? Storytelling and juxtaposing images is has this infinite quality of possibilities, and um, it's the combination of sound, visuals that I can control fully and movement through space in the form of film uh, just excites me. And I, I believe that that medium is just so powerful and is still not fully explored. Mm. Um, yeah, it just has a lot of potential for for everything, for good, for insight, for, you know, through through entertainment mm. as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You were mentioning, you know, um, fairy tales there. I, I'm there's there is such a narrative quality, you know, to your work. And now that you say that it can become it becomes a bit clear that that you you would have been guided to this even as a small child, you were just awake and aware and kind of following along. I'm curious, though, um, because I reflect a little bit of this myself, what were some of the ones that really stuck with you as a fairy tale, as a narrative, as a child? What's something that you remember from your childhood that was just like, bang, and became part of your, your psyche almost? Oh man, Pinocchio is number one by just, wow. it's, it's, it's really vivid in my imagination and I haven't thought about it much, but there's something about, I think this is the, you know, the esoteric interpretation of that tale. Um, and I'm going to try to feel into it is you're born as a puppet <laughs> and how do you find your soul? How do you turn into a real human with choices, morals, consciousness, conscientiousness? Um, and I think there's something about that that hit me when I was a kid as well. You have all these temptations in the world that try to veer you away from the path of truth and 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 self um, self responsibility and unfolding of the truth of who we are, so that we can be fully in the world, not guided, not manipulated by outside forces. And I think there's something about that and the allies, the fairy. Jiminy, you know, the cricket, this is beyond Disney, of course, I, I was not introduced to Pinocchio through Disney, it was actually um, through the original, it was an Italian story with some amazing Italian illustrations. Um, but it's a good question. There are other fairy tales that are not, they're not immediately coming to me. Um, mm. Do you know, do you know one for me? It was, uh, I don't know where this came from, but there was a story called Three Billy Goats Gruff. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I don't know why that one stuck with me, but I also, I grew up on Aesop's fables. Uh, and, and again, yeah. Pinocchio, I remember these things and it seems to be, you know, it, it's, it's vital. It's, it's of the utmost importance, what we show children, because that sticks with you. Mm -hmm. That really sticks with you. Side note. Um, mm. 
it can also do a lot of damage if you if you actually show them some of the wrong things. No offense to my father, but I was allowed to watch the original Alien as a six year old, so that became mm. almost a fairy tale or a nightmare to me. But I became obsessed with Alien and Giger after after that. But yeah. um yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing how things like stick with us. But so you you've taken this this idea of narrative, and and again before we get stuck into the film, because I really want to unpack that thing and 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 everything in there. And your your style as an artist, where did you where did you study your craft? Where did you learn mm -hmm. to create images like that? Hmm. How did that come so about? Yeah, yeah. So I feel I've thought about this and I, I seem to have been guided in a way by my inner compass toward art that was um, just on the side of uh, mainstream sen uh, pop sensibilities. So that's comic books, animation. However, it's been uh, increasingly more and more informed by my inner, inner, um, inner development and my sort of like greater calibration to truth. So it started out with, um, yeah, I just, I was, I was kind of like a regular kid with loving the Disney films, copying them. Um, there were a lot of, uh, I grew up in Bulgaria. There was some great illustration in there from the fifties and sixties that accompanied a lot of, uh, our picture books as well. Um, then later I got into, um, I don't know if I mentioned comic books again. I got into Frazetta, actually. I learned my anatomy from Frazetta before I went to animation school to a large degree by just uh, copying these heroic figures, um, echoing this uh, classical, you know, Greco-Roman aesthetic of the veneration of the, you know, I, I think I, I'd seen you, you've done something in the Fibonacci sequence and just... Mm -hmm. There's something about about the anatomy of the human body that really inspired me, and I feel that I'm sure other artists um, have have said this, but I feel that the human body encapsulates within it all the secrets of drawing and and, and portraying everything else in the world. Its interconnections, its rhythm mm -hmm. of shapes and flow. Um, but beyond that, I, I I got into the illustrators of uh, American illustration from the Golden Age, from Howard Pyle to Ansi Wyeth, Dean Cornwell. Um, all the way over up into a lot of the 60s, 70s illustrators who had a keen eye for composition, for storytelling, and, and they were very economical in, in their representation of these ideas, uh, you know, before the photographic medium took over. Um, and then I got into, uh, you know, anime has been, um, the older anime has been an influence to me, um, and just reality overall. So... I think there was a point when I my art was very organic and round and uh, due to necessity in Toronto at the time when I started my uh, career in 2007 there were mostly projects animated on the program flash which which used and still uses very angular designs that was sort of the thing so I, I started turning my designs uh, in a more angular style and adapting my sensibility to that to, to be employable at that time. Uh, and it sort of stuck. And that angularity and that sort of sense of design started um, informing my aesthetic overall. Uh, and then beyond that, I, you know, I got into, I, uh, we haven't spoken about you know, my trajectory in my career, but I was a character designer for a number of years. And as a character designer, I was kind of tagged to, to draw in different styles. And that was my, I was very excited to try different styles. It was both a frustration and a uh, source of reward. Frustration in that I wasn't really developing a unique style, even though some people may disagree. And I, I was I was frustrated that I couldn't explore all the styles that I found interesting that were emerging from other designers and just from sculpture, whatever it was. Um, but satisfaction in that I was exploring all all this all this stuff. So I don't know if that's enough. Um, mm, maybe I, absolutely. Yeah. Can you give me an example of of maybe some of those um, some characters that you've designed for, you know, media, television, movies, or, or animated cartoons, or whatever? Like what 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 are some of the projects that you were the highlight of your career so far? <laughs> highlight, if we, yeah. That's, if we can uh, call it that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. See, I, I can't even speak about that. That whole notion. It's it's interesting about the heights of a career 
sort of a career uh, achievements. It's, it's interesting. I'd love to touch upon that too. But um, so in my character design career, I did, I did a lot of development work, both in Toronto in a boutique uh, studio that I'm actually uh, working with right now called House of Cool. So we did a lot of development, uh, IPs, intellectual properties, as well as in Star animation, Star's animation, Arc animation, and those are those no longer exist. Um, so a lot of that work was never to be seen. It, it was a, a variety of projects that never saw the light of day. But other than that, I I art directed and designed um, a web series by for LeBron James, the NBA player. Um, not really proud of that for various reasons, just the way the production. Uh, went, but that's one thing I designed on mm, Watchmen had uh, the Watchmen the movie had uh, an accompanying animated short that came out with it. I designed on that. That was it was a bit more comic booky. Um, I've done work on there's an upcoming independent film that I designed also the characters on from one of my one of my friends uh, Rodrigo Perez Castro. Uh, it's a Mexican 2D film. I have done, I've done work and development for Disney TV, for just some DreamWorks stuff, and again, a lot of it not seeing the light of day. Um, man, see, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't thought about this, uh, the design field in a while. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something, hmm. something uh, more noteworthy. Let's ju- let's jump into the film, because uh, I, I'm dying to ask you about In Shadow. <laughs> what compelled you to embark on such a project? Hmm. So it was a deep sense of meaning and purpose with my talent and gift and a responsibility in using it wisely. And this wasn't just a philosophical statement that I worked myself into out of some ethical responsibility. Surely that's there, but it was a felt deep sense of, of that this needed to happen. So I was working on, I was storyboarding on, a, I'm not gonna say the project, but it was a big, big studio film. It, it was a sequel. Um, and <laughs> I was my, my work of unveiling the world and how it worked, how I fit into it and what was happening was reaching um, a boiling point of understanding uh, in, in which I started through which I started getting this imagery um, in which I would see I would perceive something in our reality. I would perceive either the injustice or the illusion of it. And then I would get imagery of this, these surreal, almost clairvoyant visions of this is the reality of this according to my inner symbolic language. So let's say pharmaceutical peddling of, of drugs, et cetera. You know, it could be interpreted one way by the media edifice. However, there's a different reality to it. So a very simple image would, or sequence of images would come to me that would feel so, it, it would really hit me and there would be a knowing. I, I would get a knowing that this is, this is right. This feels good. And I need to share this. And so there was a, an accumulation of images as, as I started surveying my understanding, my emerging understanding of all the institutions that created our life and cities and country everywhere else that constructed this sense of normalcy that we were in. And as that sense of normalcy started crumbling for me, this sort of this collective consensual reality started crumbling to me. I started noticing the disparity between the way I was experiencing reality and the way my peers and the, my in-group my family were experiencing reality. So that disparity brought some separation, aloneness, loneliness, and frustration. And, and that frustration of using my verbal, verbally trying to relate things to people did not work in a way that I felt my visual, um, this visual tapestry would. And so it was from the beginning that it occurred to me that this could be a powerful digital spell with which I could seed ideas in a way that could germinate into a greater sort of like by, by sort of uncompromisingly and unforgivingly showing a barrage of images in a short time, create something in the audience that, that, that would just unearth a whole bunch of processes and activate them hopefully to the point where it could, it would germinate some sort of response that would hopefully inspire the individual to look within, look without, or to, to have more courage to take on the perceived darkness as I, as I see it, as I understand it, and as I propose exists. Um, and, and, and in a way, it was, um, it was a call to action to all those 
beings, humans, are you know our fellow humans who are inspired by that warrior impulse of truth and compassion for the world. So, wow, wow. So let me, let me ask then: what what's the reaction been generally to that film uh, when you <laughs> have shown your peers? Did it work? Did the communication? Did it land? Yeah, it's interesting. It's for most people around me, not quite. I have a select few close people that are just completely in tune to, you know, they understood it, they got it. And um, in, in the animation field, um, you know, some people have responded well to it, but by and large, um, you know, animation, like every industry, it consists of a lot of people following a certain form of conduct, a cer certain worldview. And um, I, you know, there was, I, there, it didn't hit in a way that, um, I think it did with the general audience. Now the response from the general audience was has been immense to this day. Yeah. So I deal. I try to be responsive and, and you know respond to people whenever I can. But uh, Instagram, Facebook, email. You know, there, I've, I just continue to get powerful correspondence, um, really affirming of this art. And mm -hmm. before I made this piece, I I questioned uh, the ability of art. To actually inspire people in a, in a in a functional way, I started questioning that yeah. because I would see even here's a powerful film. It it showed us this dynamic of power and intrigue and etc. And it showed showed us some sort of blueprint that we could overlay into all these other situations in the world and make sense of them in a way, right? And and I didn't see that happening. Sorry if I'm being a bit vague here. I no, don't have no, no. concrete examples, but so I started losing my uh, my confidence in in art as a as an agent of of insight and change. But having run this experiment within Shadow, I am now confident. It's inspired me to move forward with uh, greater intentions, um, and I've been inspired by the yeah by by the deep grateful uh, reception and all the insight I've received from the audience as well. The the reason I, I, I ask, you know, how, what, what's the effect been on, on people is because I, I'm now personally going to use that film when I email it to people rather than emailing them the links to go, hey, look, OK, we all know about uh, the current um, air quotes pandemic. Uh, we all mm -hmm. know about, uh, you know, these things that have happened in the past. There is an alternative point of view here. There is something else that is running. Now, I, I've said to many people, I, I've got an idea about this. They're not my own ideas. It's not my original thought or anything, but there are people out there that are truth warriors. Um, I, I love that term, by the way. Um, and they're trying to get this out there. A lot of them say this as well. Like, I hope I'm wrong. I'm ho I hope that it is not what I suspect it is. Because the thought of it being what I suspected is the nature of reality being, you know, this this facade and there's something darker behind that curtain. That is terrifying. And so as I'm trying to give people names, dates, scenarios, proofs, all of this evidence, and I'm just like and my brain stores it and I just go, oh, that incident that occurred back then. OK, did you know this, that, that they were running an operation over here? Did you know that was directed by this organization? Did you know this individual who's tied there and sits on this board of directors and just going through it like an encyclopedia still? Mm -hmm. And then this one guy I was talking to not so long ago says, the media isn't owned. What are you talking about? The media is there mm. to tell us the truth. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Are you seriously kidding me right now? I, after everything I've just told you, and now I just want to go, you know what? Watch this. Just watch this. <laughs> and I, I kind of, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of people out there that aren't ready to wake up. I'm sorry if that offends people listening to this. I, I really mean no offense at all. I say that out of absolute love. And I think that it was what you've done here. I see a lot of love in what you've created. Um, mm -hmm. So I am gonna, I, I, I'm all over the map here, Lubomir, but I, I think, I think w what that has done for me, it has reaffirmed for me on a deep personal level that art is absolutely necessary, that it is, it is mm -hmm. of the utmost importance. And you got me thinking about my career, because again, just, just on a bit of a tangent here, the, 
my I thought my role as an artist, and maybe it is to some extent, but it gave me a new appreciation for it, I suppose. But my role, I thought, just create pretty pictures. Give people a distraction from what is going on. But the whole time I'm painting these landscapes and these seascapes or portraits or whatever and trying to create the most beautiful pictures I can create, the, the, mo the best I can do, I'm trying to get the best out of myself. While that's going on, I'm educating myself on what's going on in the world. So there's this dichotomy, this, this darkness and this, this thing that is running the world. And, uh, mm. you know, because I come at it from a particular, you know, a Christian lens. Um, and, and I see that darkness as Satan. I, I do. That's just mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. And mm -hmm. I, know, I know I share that view with a lot of other Christians out there, but a, there, there is this, this undercurrent running through. So while I'm researching all of this stuff about the way the world really works, I'm trying to create these beautiful landscapes. But you got me thinking, it's like maybe there's a way I could create some art that started just pointing at this. And I think great mm. art does that. It, it does more than just giving you a moment to go, ah. Oh, it, it has something yeah. in there yeah. that really it makes you go, ah, oh, or wow, or man, and just share it, talk about it. You've, you've now, that, that's been seen by over 3 million people on YouTube alone. I know probably elsewhere it's been seen by, by many more because it's been shared on social media and all of that. So it's probably gotten out there to more than 10 million people. And, and I, I'm sure it's had that effect with people, you know, uh, of just going, mm -hmm. whoa, dude, check this out. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. Um, so yeah, just to let you know, it really stirred something in me deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, and that just validates uh, a lot of a lot of my intentions and the hard work <laughs> that I put in it. But you you said a lot of great things, and I I wanted to really go down like three or four tangents of what you mentioned, please. And I, I think I very briefly I want to say first of all, in looking at your art, I, I just want to say there's um what i feel and its purpose to me is is an invitation to look at the awesome beauty that emerges out of creation right and if we don't have that that attunement to beauty then we are just these cogs in in this functioning in the society running through these circuits playing a game that we did not even agree to so what you're providing is an invitation and as you hone your craft and you, you're super talented and skilled the way i see it is that deeper invitation for more and more immersivity and like in the composition and the way you you choose to illustrate that for for the audience i think gives us that greater feeling of being connected to something mysterious beyond us yeah. right something greater that is emerging um so i just wanted to validate your art in that way that's that it's doing yeah. and it's, it's oh, doing a necessary you, good you, you know um um and then i wanted to touch upon just the the people who will not or do not want to wake up and yeah i think those of us who start going down the path of truth for lack of a better term we kind of want the others to jump upon we have this party with a community, with a camaraderie of, of hey, look at this and that, this curiosity, the sense of holding um, these disparate pieces of information that don't fit the official narrative, yet they're there and we can't deny them. And I think it's, it's such a process of building that capacity to hold the discomfort that comes with anomalous data that completely shapes our worldview and, and breaks it down and lifts, leaves us barren in a desert of meaninglessness. Like my whole life was built in this structure that government work, works th these ways, right? Presidents act in these ways and that's all there is to it. Hollywood and you know, like the, all these industries, the banking system works in a way that's just like that. So um, there's a great discomfort and a capacity of, like, of inner growth, of individuation, of individuality and that comfort needed to be able to stand apart from the crowd and withstand the scorn or the isolation for at least for a little bit all in the name of truth and being grounded in reality so it's a process and i you know i kind of now i, I just see that that's a choice and that's a choice for everyone's inner growth and the the the, the, cho the choice to grow one's soul into a a greater entity 
which can really be here in love, compassion, growth, generation, as opposed to destructiveness, resentment, and all these other negative feelings that are being triggered right now all over the world. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch upon, you said, you know, from a Christian point of view, this is Satan. And yeah, so that framework overlays over what we see. And, you know, if we see, I, I'll propose that the satanic energy is one of materializing and limiting and like cutting off from spirit and, and, and keeping one bound to illusions, to sensual pleasures, to to non gratify like just things that never satisfy the fullness of our being, right? So it's the rat race. All these things you could say are satanic. They're the degenerative force of entropy in science, right? It's like, if you don't put extra spirit, extra energy into something, it degenerates into nothing and it, and it goes back into matter, into, into just this automated process of nature. Whereas when it's infused with that greater spirit, with our consciousness, as we invite it by clearing all the distortions and impurities of our personality, of our ego, uh, there's humility, but also courage to reach out, to be greater. Um, then, then um, I think that the journey really starts rolling. So mm. those are those are the three things I just wanted to address. So sorry. For... With and on that, like it's the reason I the reason I'm a Christian, um, and this mind you, this is very new for me. I've only been Christian uh, for the last seven months, and and now it's mm. what I feel is the beginning of a lifelong journey. I don't get in the in the you know, I I don't kind of limit that and say, okay, I'm a Christian. That means I fit into this framework. For me, this has kind of been a vehicle for uh, discovering more and more of that truth. And I feel that, again, that that satanic force and satanic energy, it's, I mean, you said it perfectly. It is, it is so entrenched in the physical in the here and now and, and materialism and actually making us by distracting us with everything that is titillating, everything that triggers the senses, everything that, that, that gives us that dopamine spike, and it keeps you locked in the here and now. And it actually just cuts you off from God or whatever you want to call that. But I, 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 for lack of a better word, I call it God. I can't define God. Um, and that's why, I, I'm just on a side note, I'm, I'm such a fan of not necessarily the Tao, but the way the Tao was written, because I think it's a pretty good way of, of defining the undefinable. The first line of the Tao Te Ching is, is the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The minute we try to define this thing that is God, that is spirit, that is creativity, creation itself. Um, and again, I, I want to make sure that people don't get it twisted. I feel God is very separate to the creation. I'm not a pantheist. I, I feel that God is a creator and created the creation. So, but, but what the Tao did is it tried to, it, 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 it summed this up by saying, listen, the minute we start talking about it, it ain't it. Because it's so beyond our perception alone. You know, it's so beyond what we, could, we can communicate with words. But, you know, it reminds me that, that the way this thing is set up is to just cut ourselves off from that, that bigger spiritual quest of communing with God. And... You know, it's almost like there was this te there was this experiment in a lab where there was um, electrodes attached to this uh, rat's brain that when they triggered the electrode, it gave the rat an orgasm. And the rat could actually trigger its own orgasm so by an electric plate. There was food, there was water there. there was, so there was a complete experiment set up. And this thing just kept hitting that button and just kept <laughs> getting off by hitting that mm -hmm. button and it starved to death. It just kept going more, 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 more. And I was like, whoa, dude, I think we're mm -hmm. exactly the same. And so when I look yeah. at the, the opening frames of your film, I, I realized I have a problem because I'm sitting there doing this. Who liked my post? You know, uh, I got to get back to this person. I, and, and it's like, it's insane. We're all that mm -hmm. rat in the cage hitting that button. And yeah. it just pulls us further and further and further away from finding ourselves and communicating with a higher power. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and that's partly what I, in part what I wanted to illustrate and, and shadow was our complicity in the system of this disempowerment and, and illusions and sleep. Uh, because 
that's our personality, right? We're born into this world uh, as a human organism that then has to be socialized in these ways of behaving in society. And of course, we have our uh, parental traumas and misunderstandings about reality based on, you know, good or bad intentions by by our parents. And so we start building the social persona, which can then successfully interface in this world in a way that we don't feel vulnerable and we feel like we have some sort of control. And so that sort of patterning that we have, that's our social mask. And that's, I just very, just very briefly, very, in a, in a way, cliched way, illustrated that with the social mask. And especially with social media right now, we're actually asked to constantly curate that mask, improve it, you know, install new app upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it's because it hijacks our nervous system, our neurotransmitters, and it gives us these hits, these addictive hits of dopamine and the, this feeling of belonging. It's, it's very pernicious. So it really does trap us. So, mm, and, mm. and, and bringing, among the other things I try to bring up in, 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 in shadow is by shedding light on that mechanism and on that the, its presence, I'm inviting the audience to see it and be like, ah, okay, that's there. So I feel like a lot of art, conscious art has to be, the artist has to be peering into reality, making sense of it in a personal way, and then illustrating it in a it, it, all these things we know these things, but artists have to keep reinventing them every decade, every year, every age. You know, we we you can be saying the same things as the ancient Greeks, the Egyptians, etc. But we need to put it in our own cultural language so that people can continue to realize what this game is about. Mm -hmm. Don't forget yourself. You know, open to the reality. Be your own guide. Don't fall into other people's games and their narratives. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and you do, you get these literary giants. I mean, back in the day, it was people like maybe Orson Welles or, or um, what's the guy's name? Uh, George Orwell. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you had in one of your, uh, one of the frames on the film, there's a news report and on the TV screen, there's a social mask with the jackboot pushed into the social mask. And there was a famous quote by Orwell that said, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stomping on, hu on, on a human face forever. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, it, dude, that's dark. It's actually dark. But if we're not careful, that's where we're going right now. And, and, yeah. you know, and again, your, your art and, and art has that potential to be able to do that. You know, I just a little bit of a side note though. Um, um, on, on that, just, I just want to highlight one of the frames because, I, <laughs> and this is a little bit of a tangent, but, um, uh, so I, I've queued up these YouTube videos that I watch and, and bit shoot videos and I'm listening to talks and audio books and podcasts and just feeding my mind. And it's, it's almost never music unless I really need to hit the reset button. I just listen to my old favorite music over and over and over again. Then I get back into the, into the stuff. But there was a, on the, on the suggested videos panel on the side of YouTube, there was a whole bunch of other talks by other people. And you know how the suggested videos work, but there was one thrown in there going, I've never watched a dang rap video ever. Why the hell is this coming up? Hmm. I can't remember their name. I cannot rem uh, It's something like, um, uh, da, da, dojo, dojo, something. I don't know. Some, some cloth eared bent that, uh, was dressed in, well, she was hardly dressed, hardly dressed, just mm -hmm. wearing this. I clicked on it because for science, right. And I, I watched it and then, then I grabbed it and I grabbed the computer, took it, took it straight in to, to my wife and I just put it down and I, uh, you know, it was paused and I said, watch this. You're not going to believe this hit, hit it. And no age restriction on it at all, playing on YouTube, none. It was practically pornography. But then I was saying, mm -hmm. and I hit pause, and I said, look at this frame. Isn't this exactly like that frame in In Shadow? Where you get the, hmm. the star, the, this, this image of the female scantily clad, and everybody's clamoring in the face of this. And again, it's that rat hitting that sensor over and over and over again. But it's amazing that, that mm -hmm. we're seeing this you know, devolution or de-evolution, whatever the word is, of, of our culture getting further and further away from tradition, further and further away from beauty. And just, it's going from beauty straight to smut. 
And and I, mm-hmm. I wish I could remember because again, I, I I encourage people to try and find that video or let me know the name of it because just and they know you know it by just watching rap videos. I mean, down here at the local cafe, while people are eating their breakfast and drinking coffee, she's got music videos playing. And one morning, mm-hmm. it was just some guy with a stack of cash just doing this with the money, yeah. and there were just girls' butts. And I'm like, this this is a family place. There's porn. You're playing porn right now. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. amazing where we've gone. People aren't playing their totally. instruments. They're not singing songs. Yeah. They they sing their trash, their garbage, which is about their 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 bimbos in the club and their drugs and their guns in the trunk of the car, or whatever. And they're all auto tuned. So we've mm-hmm. completely, and that's just music, you know. Yeah, I would I would even make the argument, and I kind of alluded to it, and in shadow that you know rap was such a powerful instrument of of communication when it, at its inception that it had to be subverted and brought into this like lowest you know common denominator, and you know it's it's one of the one part of this like whole game we're playing is the age we're at right now. It's like everything's allowed. You can do whatever you want, but there's a danger. You can literally, meaning you can do what you want, but like in that you can lose yourself. You can lose yourself to your lower impulses and get stuck in there. And and that's it. Game over. You know, 50 years later, it's that's all you did was sensually gratifying yourself to to some some dead spiritual dead end. Right. Um, and, and yeah, this this proliferation of, of free pornography, of uh, sexualized images everywhere. Um, you know, they 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 are put out under the guise of, you know, um, sexual liberation, et cetera. I, I don't know if that's liberation exactly because people are not liberated when they're addicted to sexual gratification. Like how many of my peers, my friends have, you know, I'll include myself in this, have lost how much time and energy have we lost looking at pornography? Yeah. Right. How much of that adventurous, rebellious energy to create, yeah. to move out into the world yeah. is being lost right now into pornography, yes. into sort of degenerating these women, most of them abused that people just continually give their life energy to yeah. in the form of like, you know, inner substance and real energy um, and continuing the cycle. So, yeah, these are real, real issues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was something about this, and and I know it's a hot button topic, and uh, you know right now in particular. Um, but there there was something about that about the destruction of the family um, through that that kind of rap that you were you were showing, and and there was this image where you know you showed the family, and then the father was removed from the picture, then the mother was removed, and then you just left with the the young male there, and then and then it just kind of whips into to other imagery there. But it's this really mm. is a way of attacking um, the family unit. I mean, and, and you said something else there that, that yeah, it, it, we're we're allowed to say anything, anything goes, kind of thing. But but also unless you're saying, unless you're telling the truth, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, so that's not what I yeah. meant. I just want no, 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 for wanna... sure, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I just I, meant, I guess we're allowed to do and explore and think about everything, but that's where the trap is now, right? It's like yeah. you could go some dark tunnels and, you know, enslave your soul. <laughs> yeah. But, so, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, it's just, it's just, there, there's almost, Virgil Elliott um, said it best in, in my conversation with him, um, and he was saying this in relation to painting, that, you know, talking about painting is like dancing about architecture. You know, right. and uh, I, I love that so much, but there's so many different directions uh, that, that I want to go in here. And again, just getting back to the film, uh, <laughs> you're, you mentioned before you're um, and again, for, forgive me for jumping all over the place, uh, but it's such a treat to talk to you. You, you. you mentioned that earlier on that you were really influenced by Frank Frazetta towards the end of the film when you had the male, the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And again, that's just my interpretation of the image you put up there on the screen together holding that sword. It was like, man, that's that, that he, this guy must be a Frazetta fan. Like, Cause that was just, <laughs> that hit the button for me. I got three Frazetta books sitting over there on the bookshelf. I, I, I loved right Frazetta, on. you know, growing up in particular. Yeah. Yeah. But um, such a powerful image. Ultimately the film has a, a, a happy ending or, or a positive end, a profoundly positive end. Are you optimistic? I am optimistic, yeah. And there are various levels in which I can qualify my optimism. Um, overall, as the fate of humanity, I, I you know I don't know where it will go, but I am 
as I do more and more inner work, my my understanding my understanding of this whole game um, brings the power back to me and everything I can control. And all I can control are my perceptions, my conduct, my virtue, my choices, right, within this big game. And the way that I perceive the outer world is how I experience it. So if I'm constantly projecting my own inner discord that I haven't worked out into the world, whether that's like blaming people for certain things um, in traffic or wherever it is, or um, painting it with a glossy airbrush, like everything's okay. It's, you know, it's all beautiful. That like whatever it is, I, I am learning that I own my perceptions and I am in a way, while I am in this reality, I'm also creating my experience of it. So my conduct, my being with fellow human beings is all I can offer everything else that's outside of my control, I can map, I can track it. And of course, you know, based on the film, you can tell that that's just like yourself, that's something I'm earnest in doing because it makes sense for me to be oriented in the truthful reality as much as I can by, you know, consuming all this data and, and making conjectures and, and working models out of it. So am I positive overall? I think we're in this bifurcation point and that's, you know, I made the film also anticipating what we're coming into and, We'll see what that is, but uh, it's, and you know, that's why the end part was necessary. Many people react to that part the strongest, mm -hmm. but I kept it small and short. One, because I'm learning myself what it means to fully awaken, and two, it's most most important right now to really show the darkness that we need to acknowledge, understand and see and understand its mechanics and how it works, how it manipulates us, divides us, plays up on our traumas and brings us against each other in a way that puts the veil over our eyes. So I, I thought that was the necessary first step in order for us to go to the next step. So I'm I am so, so in this bifurcation point, I think we can go to uh, yeah, there there are two scenarios that I see playing out. Um, I think being being a little judicious here, I'm not going to mention exactly what those are, but but in, in a very broad way, it's yeah, it's either tyranny or freedom. And right now we have tyranny presented to us, packaged as freedom, yeah, you know, packaged as justice. Yeah. And this is where we're being played against each other, yeah. so that we can't point our finger to really what's going on, yeah. uh, and to seeing our our commonality. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am positive for my my own. I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even speak for my family and those around me. I'm positive for the sanctity of my own being, no matter what my end is, mm -hmm. gruesome or glorious in this world. Um, the the sort of inner temple that I I am I'm building is is all I can account for, and I'm very positive for that because I am on my way to more honesty, more truth. Uh, you know, I fall into the pits of projecting my issues on others. I, you know, have to deal with my own, own sense of shame, guilt, all these things, but it's, it's yeah. Moving forward. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I hope collectively we are, I think, I think we are at that point right now where people either, um, kind of wake up about what's going on, um, and make some real changes and make a stand now, uh, or, you know, we, we do have the potential to lose what we think we had, which was freedom. But then now I question again, you highlight it perfectly in your film. Did we ever really have freedom? You know, there's there's something, um, you know, there's a few frames in there. I mean, if people looked into um, the way money was created in particular, you would mm -hmm. question whether we actually ever had a free society or a free market. You know, and and yeah. what 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 have we been doing? Um, the minute I woke up to the fact that I was a, a debt slave from birth, and that taxation is theft and essentially illegal, you know, mm -hmm. people and and if people have an issue with me saying that, just look into it. Look into mm -hmm. it. Look into the Federal Reserve Act. Look into how this this was all created, and look into fiat currency and realize right now that the cash that's in your wallet is backed by nothing. And it's mm -hmm. practically worthless by design to turn you into a, a, you know, a consumer, a commodity yourself, and then eventually yeah. uh, a useless eater that can be, 
you know, <laughs> essentially mm-hmm. terminated. This is where we're headed. And, and, but there's a bigger value that we have that was given to us by our creator. And again, it's all highlighted in that film. This is just another one of those powerful images that you, you brought about. I, I, I'm curious to know, Lubomir, where, where, when did you, when did you first kind of have that aha moment that things were, were not all as they seemed? Like when, when was that point in your life? Could you take us back to that time where you're just like, whoa, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. Because hmm. I'm, I'm convinced hmm. you had one of those moments. You couldn't not have had one of those moments. I mean, I watched the dang film. You know it's bullshit. Yeah. You know it's all bullshit. Yeah. So, so w- yeah. was there a time where you just like you woke up all of a sudden? You know, unfortunately, I don't. I can't point to one certain moment, but right. it was. I think it was the first time I ingested psilocybin mushrooms and experienced uh, the unraveling of reality as. I was this adopted model of reality mm-hmm. and um yeah just this this other in- form of intelligence that was emerging through me and recontextualized reality i think that was the beginning of it unraveling now you know before that i had dabbled into in you know f- philosophy and many other disciplines but when that happened i started going into the um the a lot of earth traditions around the world, whether it's like from my land or the land around the world and started looking deeper into, you know, organized systems of thought. And, um, but yeah, yeah, I don't really have, didn't really have an aha moment that I can, uh, that'd be nice and juicy to, to relay, but I, I, I can't remember it. Yeah. I think it was a cumulative step of unfoldings that was just, that, that gave me that overall sense. Yeah. I'd, I'd have to say yeah. me too. It was bit by bit, but I, I yeah. as I heard things, oh, by the way, you remember that big <clears throat> event? You remember it's not, well, just be aware that's not what they told you it was. When somebody told me that, I'm not going to mention what it is because I'll totally get my ass deleted. But, uh, yeah. but uh, you know, at, at first when I heard about that, I, I, uh, um, I was angry at the person. Isn't it amazing that I'm now, I'm actually, I'm actually censoring myself right now. I think that mm-hmm. mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you, overlords. Well, I'm actually pulling up my own language right now and not saying what I actually really want to bloody say because yeah. I'm worried that my social media is going to get taken away. Don't take away my social media, my, my precious dopamine. No. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no. The level, the, the, the bandwidth, the, the spectrum of, of allowable discourse right now is so tiny. Oh, and man. every everything else gets censored and pushed to the side. And when you speak to more uh, to people oriented to sort of like normal mainstream reality, they're not aware of this yet. Yeah. It's it's a it's an apocalypse as far as expression right now. So anyone leaning away from just this thin band of corporate created, it's not just corporate. It's this you know of course this whole structure, but it's of this this one allowed form of discourse is is pushed to the side. So. I think we have as a community and those who seek to communicate honestly and discover this emerging reality through communicating and, 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 and sharing and, and, and debating, whatever it, it is, we have to find a way to, to, be, to speak about these things. And I'm not sure what the answer is yet, but for instance, you, wanna, you provide a lot of value to your viewers with your platform. And, and I see it. And I, you know, as I've surveyed uh, your, your body of work, it's excellent and and it would be a shame for you to sacrifice that you know for a moment of truthfulness unless i guess it really matters and it's a mm. shifting utterance of truth and yeah. and the question is how do you weigh those two like do you you know do you provide value in this one way and keep quiet in another or mm. it's we have a lot of interesting questions emerging for all of us yeah yeah especially was, youtube creators like yourself yeah i, I was doing a live stream uh on instagram um, a little while ago and uh, <laughs> after I did it my dad I, my dad and I were talking on the phone and um, he said uh, he said I watched your live stream I'm like how did you even do that I didn't know dad knew I was doing live streams but now he's checking up on me and I love my father I really do uh, but he said he said I loved everything about your live stream it was excellent except for one part <laughs> and I said, what was that? I knew what he was going to say. He said, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Jeff Berwick, that you, you were watching him. And um, if people watch Jeff Berwick, I mean, the way my dad said, he said, people don't want to know about tacos and kisses. 
and a little inside joke for you Jeff Berwick fans out there. Um, but because dad's seen it as well, and dad's kind of onto what's going on. He said, Andrew, shut up, shut your sure. mouth. Like, you're like it, it, what, what, what the hell are you doing right now? You, you, just put a lid on it. And this, this is fighting inside myself. This is probably turning into therapy. But this is, this is, this is a fight with, with me inside. It's, it's like, yeah, speak the truth. Do this. Like, I mean, this is why I, I guess I've got the utmost respect for you and admiration because I watch that. I'm just like, this guy does not give a shit. Like, he's just, he's just boom throwing it out there. I mean, maybe you care. Obviously you care, but I mean, it's like, it just seemed like there would have been this moment, screw it, whatever. Like you don't hold back. I mean, there's a picture of a politician sitting at a desk and the desk photo is a slice of pizza. Now I'm not going to explain what that means, but you really are just putting it all out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we have, we have to, you know what, like how much for, how long can we crawl and the earth and slither around and live on our knees. No, no. Now we have to be smart about it, yeah. but uh, also be defiant to all these lies. Again, it's all consent. I yeah. like I simply do not consent to these realities that I'm imp are imposed on me. And the horror that I think what is well, it is emerging. We're seeing a groundswell of this. It's it's going to be quite unreal for people to to swallow the truth of these things that you just mentioned, right? Okay. They're horrible truths. So 10 years ago, when I started digging into the reality of that, it was in speaking to my friends about it. You know, my, my friends generally respect my opinion and you know, I generally ground my my uh, conclusions into truth, um, corroboration, uh, truth, that's <laughs> into co and corroboration, mm -hmm. good sound research, etc. So these topics, I was they were the darkest topics. I could not believe this was happening, but I made sure to know that this, OK, yeah. this is. This is substantiated. And now, 10 years later, we're seeing um, uh, a critical mass of awareness of this backed up by by real information. Mm. And I'm not sure how people will make sense of it that we're not we're not warmed up to this to this reality, mm. you know. But um, yeah, exactly. So it's one of those one of those things. If, if I had said it in any more of an explicit way, it could have gotten me canceled because that specific issue, you know, many people have lost their lives over and. And, you know, I'm being a bit dramatic here. I'm just an artist, you know, putting some uh, I've, I have a lot of plausible deniability built into in shadow. Right. Mm -hmm. So while I was calibrating its imagery for a certain impact to commun communicate certain ideas, mm -hmm. I also had to make sure that it's it won't be thrown out. It's like the, don't throw out the baby with, out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. But also I could have plausible deniability for any of the images mm -hmm. and how they're interpreted, because after all, they're just images. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. 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 Well, that, that politician just really likes eating pizza. I mean, yeah, that's what, it. What, what, Straight what's, up. what's it mean? You know, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Um, so let, let's say there's somebody listening to this podcast right now and they haven't shut us off right now. And mm -hmm. they're, they're just kind of going, all right, what the hell are you guys talking about? What are you talking about? Um, there's this uh, quote, maybe we can riff on this for a bit, but just to give a an example of a particular dynamic that is actually happening today in the world and with the current situation. And this is something that's kind of alluded to in, in your film in, in more ways than one, but just kind of the nature of the system. Right now in the, in the US federal government, you've got regulatory agencies um, like the EPA, the, um, the FDA, uh, the CDC, you've got these, or, or, you know, government bodies, so to speak. So the, these are government agencies hold and, and as the watchdogs over um, big business and, and, and to make sure they're not run rampant. Th those, those government organizations like the EPA and, and the FDA, EPA is stacked full of ex big oil employees. CEOs, bosses, all that sort of stuff. So the FDA is stacked full of... Uh, Big pharma, big agra, big chemical, uh, ex executives. Mm -hmm. Look it up. That's a fact. So mm -hmm. who's this? Is a regulatory body that is designed to keep the the interest of the people in mind. Yet it turns around, and it's actually looking after the companies. And I live in an area right now, just to give people like when you wake up to this, 
uh, you'll see it like literally in your area right now in the beautiful rolling green hills of Lawrence at a particular time of year, they spray wholesale the side of the hillside, Mm -hmm. killing the ground. When they kill the ground to kill all the weeds and stuff, they then turn the earth and then they plant kale and they plant, uh, you know, swedes and that sort of stuff. And they have a winter Mm -hmm. crop for the livestock to eat during the winter. And then it gets converted back to pasture in order to bring the ground back again. They then dump Hmm. massive amounts of fertilizer. This is then running off into the streams and it's killing all of the amphibians and all the fish. And we know it's killing all the amphibians and fish because we can talk to old timers here in this town who remember catching tadpoles in the streams with nets when they were kids. And they send their grandchildren down, oh, you're going to catch a tadpole. Sorry, granddad, no more tadpoles, no more fish. There haven't been fish here in decades. Now, what's happening then is we actually live here in the south of New Zealand in a cancer hotspot. No one knows why. People are absolutely clueless. But these companies have come in. They've bought the government. They run these nationwide. Then the, these, these little country districts and towns and areas are lobbied by these very companies to buy that chemical to run this system, which is the, the, it's the opposite of health, opposite of health for the environment, opposite for health for humanity. You know, the, the can, mm-hmm. the, the, these chemicals that are being sprayed wholesale on the landscape cause cancer. We know they cause cancer. They cause cancer in the mm-hmm. animals. They cause cancer in human beings and they destroy the environment. Now, yeah. why are we still doing it? And we're still doing yeah. it because no one knows because the minute the story gets out there, it gets removed, it gets pulled. Well, yeah, even if it has an opportunity to get out there, why aren't any editors seeking to do these, these stories? And yeah. why are new, you know, all newscasts, why are late night talk show hosts ridiculing people or anyone who actually brings these issues up who is curating our information in a way that people think it's all ridiculous and only these things only happen in movies right now i'm speaking to like what is that dynamic that happens like for instance i think it was in 2019 wasn't there a man in the states who won a i think it was like a 20 million dollar i don't know the number a case against monsanto for this this particular chemical yeah um so so this is a reality now why if if you know the the world health uh, experts are really interested in our health Mm. why haven't they banned the substance now Mm -hmm. especially given this ruling in a federal court Mm -hmm. you know why aren't journalists writing about it warning us about it Mm. people people should really ask themselves these questions Mm -hmm. so yeah they're the hard questions man and and again um, to bring it back to your film, th- these are these. It's just laid out plainly, you know. Mm. It, it, but the thing that I liked about your film is that it's just in 13 minutes you touched on every single facet of society that that I could think of. Anyway, maybe there's more. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But but for me, it was like those those big ones. You know, we've got some sort of military industrial complex. We've got big pharma, big agriculture. You know, food creation. We've got things that are running our culture, entertainment you know, movies and music, and then our technology as well. And, and everything is just, it's, it, and you, what we tend to do, and I think this is part of, it's an artifact of the system itself, is we tend to compartmentalize and we focus on pieces without seeing the big picture, the whole thing. And, and this is, again, one of those things in this film, is it you can see clearly how everything relates to, to everything mm-hmm. else. It, it ties together as a whole, for one set reason, which is the destruction, this is just my interpretation of what I got out of your film, destruction of humanity. So when I look at it through, through the Christian lens, I see this as the work of Satan to destroy God's creation and destroy his, his, his beloved children. Um, and, and when you come at it from the Christian lens, you realize that Satan was given free reign over this world. Um, and this is, he is the God of this world. And it's almost like there's a deal between, uh, mm-hmm. Satan and, and God to say, right, you have free reign. My, my children are going to choose me though, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it, it, this almost seems like a, a, a proving ground of sorts. I'm still really mm-hmm. trying to unpack these huge ideas for myself. But again, sure. it, it's, it's, it's that awareness. When you shine the spotlight of awareness onto it, um, then the choice becomes clear. 
You know, it becomes mm-hmm. absolutely crystal clear. You have to choose something else. Totally. And, and I just want to, for the benefit of the audience, anyone who maybe, you know, doesn't subscribe to the Christian worldview particularly or, mm. or does whatever, I just want to give a, a, a framework that fits perfectly into that because it's mm. a, our world culture, world history, that's the essence of it, and that's the hero's journey, yes, right? Sir. So if we look at it from a mythological structure um, or even like a uh, trans site tr- transpersonal psychological structure like a Jungian kind of framework it's we come into this world uh, living in unconsciousness and unconsciousness just means we repeat patterns of behavior that we are not in charge of so we are in a way in reaction to the world Mm -hmm. and the way the world comes into us we just sort of react and that's where you know culture can be created imposed on people and people can just sort of like stumble their way through it so that's how we start out. But then we're, we are called on this journey, uh, this call to action. And we either accept it because it's challenging and it's disturbing or we deny it, at which point we wither and we sort of like just die off as, as many of our fellow humans, I think, are doing. And many of us are just trying to stay afloat and, and, and earn through our inner work that light of consciousness where we com- communicate and integrate and embody something greater. Right. And that greater aspect only comes through the hardship and the anguish of facing the shadow, the darkness within us and without uh, outside of us. And so only when we map that, we face it, we address it. We, you know, we do battle and battle can involve love and anger, right? Just anger, et cetera, many aspects. Do we then clarify, clarify to the point of earning the boon, which we bring back to the village, to the people? to our fellows, to our family, in which we can say, I have gone through the journey. I speak from experience and I have earned my, that's when our words carry weight because people know that there's, there's an inherent knowing when a person is speaking from experience and, and attainment. And so I just wanted to give that, that, mm-hmm. that, that framework because I agree with exactly everything you're saying and wanted to kind of hit it from another point of view as well. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think this is this is one of those things that I mean, that's the story of of uh, Jesus uh, of sorts. I mean, it is is a hero's journey type story. Yeah. Um, and depending on mm-hmm. how you want to interpret that, I mean, that's that's exactly the interpretation I take. Um, but mm-hmm. um, it's extraordinary. So with, with I, I've spoken about this in the podcast before. Um, let's just jump onto a, a different track with Amir. Um with, with the podcast and the way the podcast originally originally started was just trying to get a take for how people ran, you know, the, the business side of things and how they made it as a creative professional. And I'm curious, again, seen as what we're talking here with, with the film and what's happening currently in the world, like right now with the pandemic, uh, what, wh- where do you see yourself going like how are you going to pitch move and adapt within this changing world and maybe maybe what would you what advice would you offer to young people that are just just kind of waking up maybe a young person is listening to this right now and maybe this is part of their awakening process and they're going shit this is not what i thought it was i've been lied to about everything i've been essentially i've been a prisoner in a government indoctrination camp called a school uh, and and now, uh, what am I going to do with my life and my career? So uh, may, there's, there's a few questions in there, but I'd love to hear about what you're going to do now in the face of a changing world, um, because, you know, they're tanking the economy right now. How do you adapt and move? And what advice would you have for, for some younger people out there, you know, wanting mm-hmm. to jump into something creative? Mm, that's a tough question. I, I wish I could be very helpful to young people. I'm not sure I can be, but I can maybe work my way into this by just speaking into like maybe my journey or where I'm at and perhaps some okay. sort of a, <clears throat> something instructive can come out of that. But where do I see myself? So first and foremost, I don't have to do art. Um, that's I've made peace with that. I don't have to do it. I don't have to work in animation. I don't have to do anything. I mean, I have to provide, uh, yeah, sustenance, <laughs> uh, you know, for my body, and that's it. So, it's see the issue here is, um, my mentor said, he, he has this phrase that says, uh, "How free can you afford to be?" And you know, currently, I, I can't afford to be too free because I've 
just put myself in, I'm, I'm employed right now by one of the streaming services. I'm directing a TV series. And it's like, yeah, I can, I'm still free to express myself, maybe not to the extent that I wish to, um, you know, given my views on, on media overall. So I don't want to be bound in any sort of form of servitude to compromise my truth, my integrity, just so that I can be given an award or a, a bone, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or to work on some perceivably sexy project. I don't care. I, I don't care about that. I don't. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing right now is I'm taking jobs that um, hone my craft, that um, I, in which I can work with other people and learn from, work with good people. Uh, and which can just hone my craft to the degree where I can make something more impactful. Now, um, I do have some things pending in front of me that could be very good for art in general, my expression, and of course, the audience. Uh, so it'll be just a bigger project. And I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but the way I've done things is there's a tendency, of course, to worry about the next project, the next gig, where money will come from. And... Um, I don't know how this happened to me, but I, I sort of let that worry go. It still catches me and still starts, you know, spinning tails here and there. I usually let that go. And, and this is where, this is not practical advice, but this is my truth. I sort of surrender to the process of what needs to happen. And my intention is truth, good craft, service to the world, deep purpose of myself. That means working on myself, and any of the gifts coming from my own personal inner work and my emerging and greater understanding, I would like to elucidate those with my craft to the world and be informed by the world again so I can do a, a better job at that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if that means, you know, being backed by money that's coming from a greater, you know, like being funded by whatever corporation, and if I can do that and I can make that work, then I'm open to it. If that doesn't happen, I'm completely fine just dropping everything and being like, fine, I, my life <laughs> is my art. My communication with other human beings, with my loved ones is my art. How do I hone that? Mm -hmm. So you can see that that's not a very practical way to, to uh, not a very practical advice, perhaps. It sounds good. But it, it is, it is true. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds good. And I mean, it, it's, it works for me. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's something in that. Uh, I I feel that when I'm on purpose and I'm kind of telling the truth uh, for myself, I I don't really like to use the the term, but I totally get what you mean. Uh, that the, my truth, I just try to hone in on what is the truth. Um, there is a certain practicality to it, of course. You you've uh, like I've mentioned here, like I've avoided really going into particular things because I don't want to get my ass deleted. But I think I think there's a a certain point where you where you feel like you're on purpose right you feel like you're you're living the authentic self that you're supposed to be and and that's where i find a lot of those rewards and things start coming through and rewards for me is like as you say sustenance it really is just sustenance i mean mm -hmm. one of the things i've said to to young people in particular um these ideas of having like the, these riches and fame or, or the, this wild success, like what, what do you think that it means? Define success. For me, success is owning my own house, not a mansion. I live in a tiny little house in the middle of the countryside in New Zealand. And my mm -hmm. idea of success is chopping wood and carrying water. That's it. Like, mm -hmm. and, but I can afford the firewood, and I I have the ability to get water. And and that what that is is just a metaphor for simple living, simple, clean, wholesome living. And that's it. You know, lower your overheads. Like, how many beds mm -hmm. can you sleep in? How many meals can you eat at one time? You know, sustenance. Yeah, just, yeah. And you know, your words actually inspired me to say some things because yes, to the dear young people that may be listening, I I do want to say some things. And you know, it's. If I were to give any advice, it would be don't get caught in the glamour of 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 this of any any of the markets that you may work in as an artist. Don't get caught in to, in the sort of being a, a schmoozer and a scenester. There are there are these are you get poor rewards and no sustenance of your soul or your craft when you try to 
uh, get the numbers or the likes or the views, but even beyond that, just to be a, even that inner game of trying to be some sort of name that's recognizable will inherently pervert your nature because you will try to act in a way that is not truthfully yours. You will not have an authentic voice and you will, your soul will always be hungry for more and more nutrient nutrition from the outside, which you will never adequately get. So spend that time on the front end of really working, even if it has to be in silence and, and sort of obscurity, create that solid base, create that solid base, the inner game, and the skills necessary and have your eye and open your your heart open to what is your purpose what do you want to do with your art if it's making enough money to sustain a family great make sure you're good at that make sure you have good conduct with your colleagues you have a good you know rapport with 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 uh, your clients uh, if it's doing meaningful art that that is geared towards something well yeah, learn the vernacular, the, the 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 symbolic and visual grammar. See what what issues you may want to address, and are you al aligned to truth? Are you aligned to something helpful? Um, but I would just say, don't do not get swept up by the madness of building an artificial, synthetic persona online. It's not going to get you anywhere, and you will pay for it later. Absolutely. Wow. But listen, man, that, that is, that is so well said. I don't think I could add anything to that at all. Um, I, and, and in fact, as you were saying that I'm like, there's the trailer for the podcast. <laughs> so I'll snip that little bit out. Right on. Um, you know, but, uh, isn't it interesting nowadays that, um, you know, it, it has become, you know, when we look at technology and these platforms and these mediums, it's become so much about how many follows and likes and stuff that we have. I've gotten to a point now where I, I'm blessed to have a lot of people following me and have interaction with a lot of people. But now I can't even look. I, I, I started freaking out when it hit 100,000 people on YouTube and now it's up around 300,000. I know there's people out there with a lot more, but like it just it doesn't. I can't even figure out what that means in my brain. And the minute I start thinking about the numbers and getting involved in a numbers game, I, I lose it. I start creating like absolute crap. And, and I want my videos to mean something. I want my paintings to mean something. I want it to be like honest. I don't ever want to game the system. So I'm getting something where uh, I'm going for, and people can see like you're doing this to just go for likes. I never wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Like I've now gotten to the point where I, I've mm -hmm. taken a hiatus for a couple of months because um, I've got nothing to post, man. I got nothing to post and people are like, where's the new video? Where's and I, I love that people are hungry for the new video or the new thing, but I needed to take a, you know, some time out and, and I, I have, mm -hmm. I had nothing to post. So why would I, I stay there and just keep it, be that rat, yeah. keep hitting that, that electric plate, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, I know it's like, do you want to, um, to create fluff for uh, 5 million people or something meaningful for a thousand? Yeah, like I, I immediately, it seems right that it's meaningful to a thousand people who will yeah. get something out of it as opposed to a million who will get entertainment for 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever. Exactly, man. I, and, yeah. and it's it's creating something that's real, that's going to last, that's going to mean something to those people. I, I mm -hmm. used to, because um, I, I, I've, I've now been in a couple of positions. I used to teach workshops to like, say, 10 people at a time. And I was interacting with each and every one of those people and having real conversations. And we're having like a real moment there. Real relationships were built from that experience. And that seems so much more uh important sometimes than doing mm -hmm. a video and having it go out there to a million people and it's like i i can't even think about that i can't even think mm -hmm. about that because i never saw anybody watching it going that's so cool i, I mm -hmm. you know I, i'm sure they did but you know whereas in real time i can talk to another human being and and it's it's a little bit it just it feels more natural i think that's what we're meant mm -hmm. to be doing you know yeah it's real communication and connection as opposed to this uh, imagined one when the numbers exponentially increase yeah, yeah it's, it becomes very abstract the audience becomes more faceless yeah you know Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. D seeing as we're talking a little bit about, um, you know, these things out there on screens that don't really matter much, I almost cringe. But I'm curious as to the show that you're working on at the moment and, and for what streaming services. Is this, is this something that we can look forward to seeing in the near future? 
Mm, yeah, I guess I can speak about it. Um, well, it's been announced. So it's uh, I'm I'm directing some episodes for a remake of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe uh, for Netflix. There are two slated releases. One is uh, one is yeah one is the cont- continuation of the old series, and we are doing a reimagining. So uh, yeah, we're working with Mattel and uh, Netflix to make this series. It's it's been actually very very rewarding as far as entertainment for young people goes. And again, honing my craft, my directorial craft, um, and dealing with the team, putting a story together, making it exciting, having those you know ups and downs, the rhythm of of, of jubilation, of of tragedy, of of horror, of action. Mm-hmm. So um, again, from my own craft, it's been great. Awesome. Um, as far as my you know my my personal take on things my flavor of artistry it's evident in some subtle ways but you'd never know it right uh if you just saw the series mm-hmm. um but i am developing some stuff and you know that may or may not happen and those i those are meaningful meaningful stories that i'm uh, i'm working on right now that would just leave it there yeah um yeah. but yeah awesome yeah. man well i i i was a big fan of he-man uh as a kid so I, I'm I'm really mm-hmm. looking forward to seeing that, dude. And like when it comes out, I'll have mm-hmm. to restart my Netflix subscription because there was too much agenda shit on that platform. Yeah. So I was like, I'm done with Netflix, but I will sign back up again to watch that. You know, yeah, um, awesome. Yeah. So um, I, I, just uh, one one more question on that though, like because again, I'm just I'm just kind of curious. Have you ever got anybody, you know, in a professional sense, watch your film in shadow and then turn around and go, Hey, Lubomir? Knock it off. You want another job, don't you? Shut up. Mm. Has that ever happened mm. to you? Or do you think no, it it's, do you that think it's be... cost you professionally in any way? Um, I think probably with some 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 colleagues probably see me in a different way and they probably would not call me, I imagine, for but it hasn't overall. Um and not not everyone has seen it. So uh yeah, I've had some I've had some reactions which I think betrayed the the feeling of of, of these individuals, but it's fine. I I get it. It's also the, the the type of narrative of In Shadow I think can bypass a lot of people's cognition. Like it it just won't register based on their view of reality. So you know you're pretty current in that sort of grammar. So it's in a way it's kind of preaching to the choir and hopefully inspiring something. But mm. I did make it for a general audience as well. That's why I had to simplify certain aspects. And use this really uh, appealing pop culture art, so that I could, in a way, you know, I want to touch upon this and share this with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, I don't know. It may have cost me some jobs, but I, I wouldn't have known. And I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with what I'm doing. So, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you. It's funny when I, when I was figuring out the style of foreign shadow, and that was um, <clears throat> an ongoing battle of, you know, doubt and this is not good enough and thinking of some of my animation peers that I really respect, whose craft is, you know, quite, quite immaculate and inspiring. And I felt like, man, if I do this for the animation audience, I have to really touch it up and make it feel like super, super nice. But then I'm like, but I'm not making it for an animation audience. This is not craft specific. Mm -hmm. This is art for really for the people. So I had to, you know, forgive myself and, and all these I had to make a lot of shortcuts and make this happen on pretty much no budget. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to basically it wasn't you know just me, uh, the two gentlemen who helped um, bring this to life, who composited all the images, all the illustrations I made, uh, were um, Sheldon Lisoy and um, Haram Gifford. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're very talented uh, compositors, and and they really brought this to life, as you know, as you can tell, uh, given the very limited source material we were working with Mm. just so this could come to life with no budget but i i just wanted to say it's funny because i was looking at advertising and a lot of the creatives in advertising who i i I see so much talent there which uh has you know is subservient to image prestige and corporate corporate agendas and greed and it saddened me when I was making in shadow, I was going through behance.net seeing a lot of beautiful projects in service to, you know, to nonsense, to this dark empire. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's almost like our, our fellow creatives, um, out of necessity and out of choice, a lot of times 
um, you know, just have to sell sell their talent to this greater sorcery in a way. And so I started taking a lot of cues of that visual imagery to basically stealing Empire's own techniques and putting them in, in shadow so that I can now counteract that and, and sort of uh, have a counter message in a very appealing, darkly grotesque way. Absolutely. And I've got to say, though, that that music track that runs through the film, mm -hmm. haunting. Oh, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I mean, yeah, of course, the most powerful is the impact of those visuals. But, you know, if you got mm -hmm. the wrong track on there, it just wouldn't have, have made it. But that creates such uh, an atmosphere, you know, that, mm -hmm. that beat and yeah. that, that, I don't know what it is. It's a synth, but it's the dee dee dee. Dee, 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 they kind of plays through it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't even make the noise, but people who have watched mm -hmm. the film now, hopefully, uh, will, will know exactly what I'm saying. And you'll you'll probably totally. hear that ringing in your head <laughs> as you're playing through the film <laughs> in your mind. You know, man, yeah, powerful mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. Lubomir. This has been such a treat and a joy talking to you. Uh, again, apologies for the terrible questions and being all over the map, but I was just giddy with excitement just to get you on the podcast. It's been a real honor. Uh, likewise, thank you, Andrew, for bringing me on for this wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed uh, our discourse. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to The Creative Endeavor. I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And if you did, then please click the like button, leave me a comment down below, and make sure you're subscribed to this channel. Don't forget, do me a huge favor, if you could, please, and share this episode to your social media, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, or maybe even email the link to a friend. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe. That's most important because we need this channel to grow even more. Now I've separated those two channels and I've got the creative endeavor away from my regular art channel. So I'm trying to grow the numbers here and spread the creative endeavor far and wide and let more people know about that. But again, I couldn't do that without you. So I thank you in advance for taking that little bit of effort and sharing this with everybody you know. Now, if you wanna check out more of Lubomir's work, then you can find him, of course, on YouTube. Make sure you share that film with people as well, but he's also to be found on Instagram and he creates some fantastic art, whether it's concept art or digital art. He's an amazing draftsman and he creates some really exquisite stuff. So make sure you find him by following those links in the description down below. Now, as always, you know where to find me. I'm on my website at andrewtischler.com. And while you're there, make sure you're subscribed there as well. It's absolutely free to do so. And I'm in touch with my subscribers regularly. Thank you so much for stopping by. It has been an absolute treat having your company. And I'll see you again very soon in another episode of The Creative Endeavor.